Hey. Hi. Oh, brother! Relationships between certain characters are a key part of the audience's engagement with a movie or TV show, whether that be friendships, complex bonds, rivalries, or especially romantic connections. Having these kinds of bonds between characters helps to strengthen the viewer's connection to the media they're consuming and to feel fully engrossed with the world where the story takes place, or at the very least, being able to appreciate and feel things about their favourite characters. On top of this, there's also a lot of interesting character drama that can be written when the foundations are in place, adding an extra layer of complexity to these characters and making them act closer to real people with wants, needs, dreams, personal traumas, and a good writer can make even the most terrible or mean-spirited decisions made by a character when it comes to a relationship feel natural and believable without trying to justify said action or having said action feel out of character, or that it borders on being intolerable. What I'm trying to say is that one, character writing is my absolute favourite part of writing in general, and it's what I tend to focus on when it comes to some of my favourite pieces of media ever. And at number two, modern cartoons tend to suck fucking dick at romantic relationships. Now I don't mean all of them, obviously but romance is something that even some of the best modern cartoons don't seem to be able to write well. Whether that's dragging everything out for an unnecessary amount of time, out of character decisions, pointless love triangles, questionable at best ethics, or just being plain frustrating. Plenty of otherwise exceptional shows can fall into traps like this, especially when romance itself is arguably one of the most delicate strands of character relationships. Romance makes people do stupid things, it's the unwritten rule you sign with blood, sweat, and all of your hopes and dreams when you fall in love with someone. Can you tell that I listened to Weezer yet? But even knowing that, there are so many times where both as a kid who grew up watching some of these shows and as a recently turned adult, where I was left gobsmacked at some of the choices made when it came to these characters and their love lives. On one hand, I appreciate the cartoons that are mostly aimed at a demographic of children, well, mostly is a loose term for regular show and Korra, try to show that romance can be messy, that people are very much imperfect and can do stupid things in the name of love. It's mature and kind of honest in that sense. On the other hand, a lot of this stuff can be pretty problematic at worst, especially when it comes so out of left field for a certain character. I want to look back at a select few shows that become infamous for their poor handling of romance and analysing precisely where things went off the rails. Now I will preface that this title is a little weird, and what I mean by shipping wars is that oftentimes the shipping of these characters can feel awkward and many of the facepalm worthy scenes are incredibly forced. I guess it also applies to shows that have love triangles or shows that are literally built on romance as a concept. It's a big blanket term for a lot of things is what I'm saying. I also recognise that I could have just said relationships instead of shipping wars, but I gotta get the video seen somehow without resorting to clickbait and as you all know by now, Money, 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 money. Give me money, give me money, give me money, give me money, give me I don't think this is a show that captures the sentiment of this video as purely as Star vs. the Forces of Evil. Star vs. is a modern tragedy of biblically fucked up proportions. Every new detail I discover about this show's decline fuels my urge to aggressively cyberbully it. But I already did that years ago with a very bad YouTube video, so instead we'll take jabs at Star vs. is unresting hard on for romance and pointless love triangles, head scratching and cringe worthy relationships, and how it didn't just drop the ball because of it, but instead dropped an active bomb. Starco, the ship between Star and Marco, was a ship as old as the show itself, and it made perfect sense. Star and Marco had fantastic chemistry together, and the show's bouncy energy and kinetic action scenes helped to emphasize that synergy between the two. By the way, the first season of Star vs. is seriously worth watching because it genuinely does hold up really well. Also, it's funny to look at how much the animation dropped off a cliff with season 2. Even when Tom, Star's ex-boyfriend with anger issues and fan favourite, was first introduced, he served his purpose for one episode that was dedicated to romance, which in Unfortunately, was also the episode that sealed the show's fate forever, but let's not get ahead of ourselves here. Overall, season 1 was great at handling the possible relationship Star and Marco could have in later episodes while not having it devolve into the entire focus of the show. However, problems began to arise quickly going into season 2, and even at the time of me watching it all those years ago, my eyebrow raised up through the fucking skyline when hearing this exchange. Starco was completely platonic. Starco? Make sure there's no possibility of them ever being a... Thing. I think season 2 is good, but man did it make some crucial mistakes. What started as a believable and innocent little ship as a small part of an action comedy show had turned into a mushy teen melodrama consisting of the writers smashing their toys together until the debris created something resembling a story hook. The whole thing with Jackie was, uh, fine I guess, but it started the show's complete and utter fascination with love triangles and trying to match up one of the main characters every few episodes with someone who could possibly create conflict, trying its best to avoid Starco and holding it like a 
like a carrot on a fishing pole, despite the obvious fact of it being Endgame. The possibility of Starko is what kept shippers climbing through the avalanche of confusion that was Star vs. the Forces of Evil. The story took a back seat and romance and shipping fueled the show. It drained it of any possible life. It lost that energy and charm that made the first season so great. And in mid-season 3 and 4, the whole thing just got really fucking silly. I mean, they literally put Marco and Kelly together out of nowhere with the subtlety of screaming bomb in a public space. And after not even showing them together for more time than that one bit at the end of the episode, they suddenly split off off-screen, which is revealed in an offhand comment. And this is supposed to be a twist? It's not even a twist, it's just a nothing payoff to such a nothing relationship. It was only written for one episode to stir up intrigue and drama. The star Marco and Jackie love triangle had already run its course by the time Tom came back into the picture, and the back and forth of star Marco and Tom constantly lying to each other, changing their minds constantly, wanting to be together and triggering jealousy in one another, literally cheating on each other. Hell, I only included Jackie in that first sentence because she is part of the convoluted love verse of Midness, but she is genuinely, no joke, the only one of these people that acts like a likeable human being. I, I guess besides Tom later in the season, but that's, a, that's besides the point. And distances herself from this melodramatic circle of backstabbers. I'll just say it now, Marco deserved better than Sailor Moon Thanos over here for one, but also that, even if these started out as realistic and messy relationship problems teenagers would have, they are miserably dragged out, flat out annoying, and by the time Starko is actually confirmed, the show is practically self-destructed, so you know, congrats. Looking back at this show makes me just a little bit sad, is what I would be saying if I wasn't laughing my ass off at every conceivable turn. Star vs felt like a show made by shippers, for shippers, that eventually the shippers themselves got tired of. There's only so many times you can pull the same trick before it starts becoming really mundane and frustrating. He did the same joke about three times already. I don't think it's funny anymore. You just want to go back to the genuinely interesting story, never mind, you ruined it in service of this genocidal fuck. <sighs> Sorry. All in all, it's good to look back at Star and just laugh, really. I can't feel sad. The melodrama is on CW levels. I am not exaggerating. It just sits uncomfortably in infamy as the show that lets shipping decide its fate. Also, it will forever be hilarious to me that the character that's literally based on multiple of Nefsi's ex-boyfriends is has the most actual character development in the show. Meanwhile, the character's based on her and her actual husband that get the worst writing. That's just... How do you do that? Now, I would like to make it clear that Star is in its own league of bad when it comes to this stuff, and that not every show on here is on that same level. Well, some are just plain fucking worse, but there are other shows that don't have romance as the main plot point that still tend to fumble it when trying to get all complicated with it, or when they attempt to show character progression through it. Case in point... <sighs> regular show and adventure time. <laughs> I am not going to insinuate at all that regular show is bad, it's a jolly good show. And despite my reservations with Avenger Time's later seasons, you cannot deny how important and beloved that show is. These two shows don't really focus on romance, that's not even what they devolve into. They are nowhere close to Starco levels. However, to say these shows don't get frustrating when they do give some time to their romantic subplots would be giving them a bit too much leeway. Regular show's issue largely stems from Mordecai's relationship problems with Margaret and CJ. Easily the most frustrating part of regular show is how goddamn long this stupid love Love triangle lasts. Love triangles are rarely ever done well, and from a storytelling perspective there are often really cheap ways to create character drama and conflict. Even though Mordecai becomes a better person from all of this, as seen from the ending, it is downright impressive how much he manages to fumble the bag with both of these characters. It starts out as a messy but believable struggle, but after a while this conflict gets really drawn out with constant misunderstandings, lies, and Mordecai being a complete dumbass and not learning a thing. When most people complain about Mordecai, they tend to unironically use the simp argument, which is true. It's Mr. MVP! Sam! But so many people seem to just brush off the Margaret and CJ love triangle when it was easily the worst part of the show for me. There's writing characters with believable struggles and then just having a character repeatedly make the absolute worst decisions possible and actively playing with the feelings of a character who, by all intents and purposes, barely did anything wrong. CJ just got the absolute worst treatment out of any character in this show. She has a dangerously short temper and reacted out of jealousy a lot, but nothing she did compared to how much Mordecai and Margaret complicated things with their lingering feelings for one another. Okay, she did almost kill them that one time when the Righteous thought replacing her entire identity with being jealous was a good idea. It just makes no sense for the Righteous to drop Mordecai's IQ below Arctic levels specifically when it comes to romance. Regular show's messy shipping is realistic for a while, but by the end of season 6, it's just plain silly. I just wanted to start over. Seems like everyone always wants to start over. Why don't you guys just get it right the first time? Jesus Christ, thank you. I'm also glad that pretty much everyone agrees that Mordecai intruded a muscle man's wedding and making a moment about himself 
just so he can mess up again and drive CJ out of the show was a dick move. Margaret and Mordecai stay friends after this too, if you can even call it that, they have such terrible chemistry after season 6. There's no satisfying payoff for any of this, it's just horrible decision after horrible decision, and it lasts for far longer than necessary. Seeing a cartoon have the maturity to show this side of dating is very much welcomed and it shows a sense of maturity regular show had over pretty much everything else airing at the time, but they just never managed to make it work with Mordecai and it gets tiring. Which is a shame because then you look over to Rigby and he actually manages to have and maintain a healthy relationship with Eileen that's both fun to watch and actually keeps my attention. They remain together even in the show's final scene and the way Rigby grills Mordecai in dumped at the altar and tells him to follow his gut for once shows just how much he's grown as a person from his relationship with Eileen. That's the most frustrating part of regular show for me. The fact that all of this was intentional. Every character in this show is sick of Mordecai screwing up at every turn that makes you question why they couldn't have just stopped when it was getting old. Why did they have to drag it out this long? Well, I guess in comparison, Adventure Time is nowhere near as bad as that, and I'm only really mentioning it because of how badly they ruined Finn's relationship with Flame Princess. Now, I get that this episode was very divisive, and I'm also going to get people who disagree with this, but regardless of how well this episode sets up Finn's future development, and it is genuinely really good, it just felt weirdly out of character. Tackling the idea of Finn just being unreasonably horny. In a way that's kid friendly of course, and I get that they wanted to tackle that stuff with maturity, but it really ruins Finn for a long while. You can be realistic, but it doesn't make an episode enjoyable to watch by default. I won't spend too much time on it, but Finn acted so out of character for this one episode, making his girlfriend assault the Ice King for basically no reason just so he can have wet dreams. That is a real sentence that I just said. He gets better after this, but this shouldn't have happened in the first place. Flame Princess and Finn were a good couple, a little rocky for sure, but it's annoying that this even happened. Random love drama being created by a character doing something he would have never done beforehand is one of the most hated writing tropes. It's not just that Finn's struggling with his hormones or whatever, it's that he goes out of his way to start a huge fight between his girlfriend and someone who's done next to nothing wrong, has her burn his entire house to the ground, and also wrote a bunch of nasty, insanely personal shit in a letter just to fuel the conflict. You can easily tackle Finn screwing his relationship up without going to this extreme level, and that's what bothers me of this episode. Episode. It's just too nasty on Finn's part and actively detracts from whatever insightful message it was trying to convey. I just couldn't make this video without mentioning this. I appreciate how much this helped him grow later in the show, but the episode itself makes Finn into an absolute monster out of nowhere. Even if he wanted to do a similar version of this episode, I'd consider significantly toning down Finn's actions because he genuinely wouldn't have sunk this low in my opinion. Also, I remembered how Cartoon Network UK tried hyping this episode up so much at the time. Even as a kid, I thought it was embarrassing. Kicking off with a brand new Adventure, the Frost and Fire Adventure Time Marathon. This weekend from 11 on Cartoon Network. Yeah, then we gassed this episode about a 16 year old kid forcing his girlfriend to fight just so he can yank it. Oh, Avatar Romance. Ah! I'd rather staple my ball sack to the ceiling than willingly talk about this. Romance is not my most hated thing from The Legend of Korra, but it's uniquely bad in a way that only Korra romance can be. I don't think it's a secret that I'm not the biggest Legend of Korra fan, but I've talked with plenty of people who love this show, and they all tend to agree that Korra fails hard at romance. Not only because of how Korasami happened out of nowhere, and they felt the need to make three very bad comics to justify a same-sex relationship they should have set up and written better in the show, especially when Nickelodeon was completely fine with it and you didn't need to handicap the execution, so, you know, congrats. But also because of the love triangles and the massive yikes that was everything leading up to Korosami. If you're getting sick of love triangles here, by the way, well, you ain't seen nothing yet! Back on track, uh, Korra's kind of like, the worst. I'm with Asami. Yeah, but when you're with her, you're thinking about me, aren't you? What the fuck? Right, so... Korra is constantly trying to get with Mako in Season 1 and going to his tournaments, despite him being in a relationship with Asami. And after being rejected by Mako, Korra settles with his brother Bolin. Bolin at the time had a massive crush on Korra without realizing she was going for his brother, and he just so happened to come to her at the right time after she got rejected and they started dating. Mako, being a bit of a control freak, goes to Korra and tells her to lay off his brother, and the first thing Korra does is accuse him of being jealous, which regardless of how true it might be, not exactly the play here, Korra. Oh, and then this majestically fucked up line. I'm with Asami. Yeah, but when you're with her, you're thinking about me, aren't you? It, it, it's just not your place to say that. And then Korra forces herself on him. In front of Bolin.
Marker is not exactly the best person in season 1, but does anyone ever actually acknowledge that season 1 Korra is a pretty terrible person? That's not even where this ends, as Marco finally starts developing actual feelings for Korra after this, despite being in a relationship with Asami. And Bolin lets Asami know about the kiss, causing Asami to break up with Marco, but he doesn't care and continues to date Korra anyway. And this isn't even considering the fact that after all of this, Korra trying to get with Asami's boyfriend, forcing herself on Asami's boyfriend, and Marco continuing to have feelings for it, and then the person he had a really fucked up interaction with without telling Asami, Asami and Korra eventually develop feelings for one another and begin dating. With all of that context behind Korra and Asami's relationship, it becomes very problematic. Korra Asami, regardless of how bold a decision it was to end the show on and how important it was for LGBT relationships in mainstream television, was built on a very icky foundation. I mean, how do you willingly fall for the girl who forced herself on your boyfriend? Romance has never been Avatar's strong suit, but The Last Airbender only included it as a very minuscule part of the main story and it wasn't borderline creepy. A staggering amount of episodes in Korra feature a variety of crackhead ships being smashed together and it's a complete mess. Korra has way too much dating and it detracts from a story that's already turbulent with its quality. I mean, fucking Tenzin had an ex-girlfriend and she's in the story quite a bit. At the end of the day, The Legend of Korra is a divisive show, but the many civil conversations I've had with friends and other people who adore this show allow me to take solace in the fact that I'm not the only one who hated the shipping. So far, we've only talked about a few shows that either fumble with romance when it comes to characters having their intelligence dumbed down, but not really if affecting the show too much, all the way to shipping actively detracting from the quality of the story and ruining the characters a fair bit. But none of these shows are the worst, because oh my god, I can't believe I'm finally talking about this show. Miraculous Ladybug has been my favourite ongoing catastrophe to look at from the last few years, and witnessing its fandom actively implode and lose interest over the show's long drawn out romantic tension. I've always wanted to go into this show more in depth someday because it really has devolved to such a beautiful fucking train wreck. But for now, let's focus on this. This absolute abomination of a shipping chart. Jesus Christ. Miraculous, unlike all the other shows featured in this video, has romance at its center. Its plot is paper thin, with the romance being the only part of the show people seem to actually watch it for these days. Unless they're unattended children with autoplay enabled because I refuse to believe these views are all from willing participants. So with romance actually being the focus of the show, that in theory puts it leagues above all these shows when it comes to romance, right? Wrong. Very, very wrong. The characters are pure shit. Marinette is a fascinating bundle of issues, only fascinating because they make her into an obsessive and creepy stalker without realizing that her overwhelmingly negative traits don't balance out her oh my god, that's literally me moments. The crush she obsesses over is the popular boy in school, Adrian, and she's the exact kind of Yandere, Amy Rose bundle of straw that you just want to stop and have a look in a mirror for five seconds. Getting jealous when others give Adrian attention, having his entire schedule in her room, this fucking scene. It even smells exactly like him! I must shed a tear for Christina V. And despite supposedly being more confident as her alter ego, Ladybug, she's the exact same broken mess. Adrian is a complete pushover due to stuff happening in his private life, and is happy to have literally anything whatsoever when he could have so much better. But then he becomes Cat Noir and turns into an absolute nightmare. Overly flirtatious, does not understand what the word no means with his constant advances on Ladybug, and is somehow worse than Marinette stalking because consent is kind of important. And yes, I said constant advances on Ladybug, and I think you can see the insanely complicated relationship between these two characters and their alter egos now. Marinette has a crush on Adrian, and Adrian barely acknowledges her. Ladybug has a crush on Adrian, but cannot stand Cat Noir. Adrian and Cat Noir are both head over heels for Ladybug, but while Adrian is still his usual self, Cat Noir is a flirtatious douchebag with no concept of boundaries. Bada bing, bada boom, a fucking love square. The extra point is evil. And this goes on for four seasons. Four seasons of these love-struck morons constantly doing the stance of will they, won't they, and it gets increasingly frustrating with every episode, not helped by how creepy these dynamics are. This is a show with four possible ships involving the same two people. This is a romance show that sucks with romance, because this utter sewage has been chucking down the pipeline for four seasons, with Marinette only recently becoming friends with Adrian, yet still keeps up her usual routine. This show is stuck in a perpetual limbo on top of being unintentionally hilarious, and this isn't even talking about the other fanships that have been given hints at by the writers of the show, which results in even more complicated shipping charts. Seriously, just try to understand this. 
You can't. This show hurts to think and talk about. It is an overly long mixed bag of flaming shit with a sprinkle of missed opportunities. And that's why I can't stop watching it. Seriously, the meme of this show is absolutely atrocious, so yes, it is my favorite show right now, is actually a thing. Because it's just an extraordinary sinking ship that you can avert your eyes from. There's nothing quite like a show that destroys itself despite the potential to be actually good being in plain sight. But that's a discussion for another day. Uh, not sure how to end this video. I, I think I made my point in the beginning, so I won't repeat it. So, uh, you know, watch that if you want the illusion of an actual conclusion. Okay, I will actually end this because conclusions are my impulse kryptonite. Conclusion. Stop with the fucking love triangles. Video over.